I needed this long and expensive zoom lens when I went to Tanzania on a safari a few years ago to see and capture the wildlife up close. People assumed I was using this same zoom lens when I started posting pictures and videos like these on social media whilst on my recent Antarctica trip. They were wrong. All I was using to get these was my iPhone, my regular iPhone. The wildlife was so plentiful and literally all around my feet. During this trip, I discovered there are a few reasons I was seeing so much wildlife and up so close. However, things are about to change and change dramatically, as I will explain. By the way, if you're new here, welcome aboard. I'm Gary Bembridge, and it's my goal to make it fun and easy to discover, plan, and enjoy unforgettable cruise vacations like this one. I was told to keep 15 feet from penguins, 45 feet from seals, and 75 feet from the enormous elephant seals, but they made it impossible to do. Trying to stay any distance from these creatures was challenging, particularly penguins and young seals, who just want to come and find out what the hell is going on. I learned there are no real land predators in Antarctica for these animals, unlike in the Arctic, where there are polar bears and foxes and so on. The Antarctic wildlife haven't needed to develop on-land defense mechanisms, so they treat people like me and you with curiosity or total disinterest because they don't see us as a threat, so they quite comfortably allowed me to literally wander amongst them. Their main threat, by the way, is once they get into the ocean, for example. Leopard seals eat penguins up to 20 a day, and then the orcas hunt and eat the leopard seals. However, man did almost wipe out all the wildlife in Antarctica, so why did I see so many on this trip? After the early explorers visited in the late 1800s, news of the wildlife spread. Hunters headed down to Antarctica and first slaughtered the Antarctic fur seals because the fur from the fur seals became very fashionable, much in demand. It's estimated that 1.2 million Antarctic fur seals were killed. In fact, it was so rife that in the late 1800s, one Captain Fanning boasted on one trip alone, he brought back 57,000 pellets. As the animals were not used to online predators, they basically just sat there while they were literally clubbed to death. Less than 40 years after Antarctica had first been explored, there were no sightings, I repeat, no sightings, of Antarctic fur seals at all in the area. So man then moved on to kill almost all the whales for the oil. It started around 1904 and ran up to the mid-1960s. We worked systematically through each species until we'd pretty much killed them all, and finding them was proving very difficult. Over 61,000 blue whales and 48,000 fin whales were killed in the South Georgia area alone. Now, once we'd wiped out most of the whales, Man then moved on to the elephant seals. Now this hunting was a little bit more controlled and it finally actually only petered out in the 1960s because demand for the oil basically fell and they couldn't make any money. But we created other problems that also wiped out other wildlife. So 30,000 birds were being drowned every year by fishing trawlers using extended lines with baited hooks. So the birds would swoop down to eat the bait. They got hooked and then were drowned, 30,000 of them. In South Georgia, the whalers brought a handful of reindeer to hunt and eat. However, after the whalers left in the 60s, their numbers grew to 7,000. They were eating and destroying the ecosystem and the habitat the birds relied on for breeding and nesting, therefore diminishing the birds. The whaling and the service ships unknowingly brought rats and mice that would start eating things like the tippet bird eggs and the chicks. They wiped them out across most of South Georgia, while seeds and plants that were alien to the area were growing and destroying plants key to the wildlife and the birds. So with all that going on, why was there so much wildlife that I saw in Antarctica for me to see right now and for you to see too? Although they had seemingly been wiped out, the fact that no one's been hunting wildlife since the 1960s has led to this really big resurgence over the last 40 odd years of wildlife. For example, an unknown group of around about 100 Antarctic fur seals were on Bird Island that hadn't been massacred. No one knew they were there, and they've now built up to an estimated 4 million Antarctic fur seals. Whales are slowly building back too now that they're not being hunted. Changes have been made to the fishing using kind of colored ribbons that keep the birds away, so much, much fewer are being drowned. South Georgia culled, literally killed, all of the 7,000 reindeers, a few were taken to the Falklands and got rid of that problem. They spent $13 million 
to poison and eradicate the rats and the mice too, wiping them out across the island. So all of this has meant a big resurgence of wildlife and birds across the Antarctic. However, that could be at its peak and all about to change, which means going sooner rather than later is a really good idea, while wildlife is really at this peak stage. Why is this whole issue so important? Well, the animals and the wildlife in Antarctica all rely heavily on krill. The whales, the penguins, the seals, they all eat it. And if krill stocks go down, there's a big risk to the numbers of wildlife in Antarctica. Secondly, as the planet warms and ice reduces, this will throw the ecosystem off balance and affect numbers. We're already seeing some of the penguin species are starting to move further and further south due to slight changes further in the north of Antarctica. The warming of the ocean has another impact because it affects the numbers and the stocks of krill, which as I mentioned are so key to the wildlife across Antarctica. Now the other problem is that microplastic particles are starting to work through the food chain in the area. They're getting into the water, the krill are eating them, the penguins are eating the krill, the seals are eating the penguins, the whales are eating the seals, and it's beginning to build up in the whole ecosystem. The danger is that this buildup of plastic within the whole system is going to threaten the wildlife. More and more studies have been done showing that this is a big and growing risk to the wildlife. So now is the time to go when we're seeing wildlife really flourishing. And I'm glad that I found this out, but I didn't know before I went. But this was a critical thing that I wish I'd known because it would have made me go even sooner. However, there is another mistake many people make when thinking of going to Antarctica. I made this mistake on my first trip and it took this return trip to totally and utterly rectify it. Now, most of the trips to Antarctica only go to a tiny segment of the region. Pretty much every single trip does the iconic but very limited Antarctica trip lasting around 10 days. The Antarctica region covers everything south of 60 degrees, although I, like most people, thought, think of Antarctica really as the continent. It's a huge continent, by the way. It's the fifth largest of all of the seven continents. However, most trips only go to the Antarctic Peninsula because it's easy to get to. It's about a thousand kilometers from Argentina. But by doing that, like I did on my first trip, you will only see a very limited amount of wildlife and landscapes. Very, very limited indeed. So it's amazing, but it's limited. To see the widest range in Antarctica, I strongly recommend you go on a trip that includes South Georgia and ideally the South Orkney Islands like I did on this return trip. I now saw multiple species of penguins. When I went to the peninsula, I only saw gentoo and some chinstrap penguins, and then in fairly small colonies. If you include South Georgia, like I did on this return trip, I saw king penguins in places like Salisbury Plain, where there were over 200,000 breeding pairs, 400,000 penguins. I also got to see the macaroni penguin and large Adelie penguin colonies. I also got to see the many more seal species and in huge quantities. I saw the Antarctic fur seals, crab eaters, leopard seals, and Weddell seals. On my peninsula trip, I only got to see two. Whales, you're gonna see many, many more as you travel around. We've got much more chance of seeing the humpback, the orca, and the minke whale. You'll also get to see many more varied landscapes, and not only the admittedly incredible ice and snow peninsula, and learn much more of the history. I found that to see more, you need to go beyond the peninsula. It's not enough to just go to the peninsula in my learning. I wish I'd known that before I went on my first Antarctica trip, I would have done it very differently. I'd done it more like my second trip. Around 74,000 tourists currently visit Antarctica every year. That's about as many as go to Disney World in Florida in one single day. However, there are now many more cruise lines entering the expedition cruising space and more and more people are starting to head down there. IATO, the International Association of Antarctic Tour Operators, was formed in 1991 with seven members. It now has over 100. I counted 54 operators listed as members. So not only do you need to think wider about where you go to see more, go now to enjoy the resurgence of the wildlife, but also go sooner than later because it's gonna get more crowded and definitely busier. Going when you see no other ship and just vast spaces with wildlife is magical, but it's gonna change soon. There is a real risk that man is creating new problems for Antarctica. I feel that I went to the Arctic too late because it was already changing and I'm pleased I did not do the same for Antarctica. It's an expensive trip, but the question I have is, can you afford not to go to Antarctica 
and to go soon. Now I suggest you find out how an expedition cruise differs from a regular cruise by watching this video where I start with a thing that I had not expected at all when it came to expedition cruising. See you over there.